Everyone's on it now. It's amazing. When I first started going around talking about Marxism, people laughed at me. Now it's everyone's thing. And to all these new people trying to make communism cool, I would just like to say, welcome aboard, comrades. No hard feelings. The future is bright for the working class. People love to claim that the working class. No one here is actually from a working class background. Right, but everyone here works for a living and pays rent to a landlord. Yeah, working doesn't make you working class. Spending half your paycheck on rent, not owning any property, getting exploited by your boss, none of it makes you working class, right? So what does having a certain accent is it? Do you think you can go around driving in your dad's BMW and then turn around and say you're working class because you don't get along with your boss? It's not a fashion, you know. It's an identity. I think we pretty much all have this very bad tendency to romanticize our lives and turn them into coming of age stories. YouTube is full of stories of young creatives working in tech, design, art, moving or already living their best lives in large metropolitan cities. If you ask them why, They'll probably answer that they want to be surrounded by people who look like them, who think like them, or that they like the diversity, the vibrancy of big cities, that they cannot find tasty vegan donuts in the countryside, and all of that is very true. Social media has participated in the commodification of a lifestyle, loved by some, despised and mocked by others. It's like a mirror reflecting or magnifying a phenomenon that is certainly not new group of people, young urban creatives, is emerging. Some people call it a class, and today we are going to dissect this phenomenon, uh, the creative class. Before we move on to the video, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor, The Guardian. As a video essayist, I've been relying on The Guardian as a high quality and independent source of information. I've actually used many of the articles for this video and I've also been subscribed to the weekly global issue, the Guardian Weekly, uh, for a few months now. It gathers the most engaging and relevant articles already published and it has this very unique feature that I really, really like. Here it is, the global report. Every week you get to see what's happening in the world from French politics to pop culture with Britney Spears or protests in Brazil, you'll find everything summarized in one very organized spot. I know it's not supposed to be that important, but still I care about the way the information is presented to me. And so look at this design. It's really cool, isn't it? And this article on Pinker is very, very interesting as well. Anyway, in case you didn't know, The Guardian is free from political or commercial influence. And unlike many others, it is committed to keeping its reporting open to all readers. So if you want to support The Guardian and would like to get your hands on their global weekly magazine, well, all you have to do is to go to theguardian.com slash aliscapel to get 50% off your first three months. I'm actually the only creator they're running this campaign with, and it's a time-limited offer, so don't miss it. Thank you, The Guardian, for sponsoring this portion of the video, and now let's go back to it. The phrase creative class was coined by geographer and urban studies professors Richard Florida, and I'll mention his name several times during this video as his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, published in 2002, remember that as well, is going to be a common thread running throughout this video. According to Florida, this book described the emergence of a new social class. If you are a scientist or engineer, an architect or designer, a writer, artist or musician, or if your creativity is a key factor in your work in business, education, healthcare, law, or some other profession, you are a member. Welcome to the cult. Actually, rumor has it that Florida copied that phrase from another great American thinker, Rolf Emerson, who's a leading figure of the American Romantic Transcendentalist movement and thus who championed individualism. Don't leave yet. I promise this is not a literature history class, but I believe it's crucial to understand where that concept of the creative class comes from, to then remove all the cute filters we put on it. 
The phrase creative class can be found in Emerson's uh, essay titled Power, published in 1860. He says, it is like the opportunity of a city like New York or Constantinople, which needs no diplomacy to force capital or genius or labor to it. They come of themselves as the waters flow to it. In every company, there is not only the active and passive sex. In both men and women, a deeper and more important sex of mind, namely the inventive or creative class of both men and women, and the uninventive and accepting class. That so-called natural force driving the young creatives to magnet cities and leaving the uncreative behind is exactly what we're experiencing today. And what is at stake in Florida's book? Namely, how can large cities attract young creatives, attract wealth? Both Emerson and Florida put a pastel filter on a very complex phenomenon. Both naively looked at what was unfolding in front of them. The Gilded Age for Emerson, the revival of city centers for Florida. They were both fascinated by the impact a city could have on you and what you, in return, could do to change the city. I've been following a good amount of vloggers since I started watching YouTube and I've seen them moving to big cities to find their true self, to live life to the fullest or just be part of the cool kids. Basically, a city's job availabilities isn't the only thing young workers look at anymore. In the 1950s, 80% of men commuted the hour from their white suburbs to Manhattan, but today those same workers want to live as close as possible to the city centre. Cities are now the place where they work, live, but also meet and socialise. As Florida theorised, an economically successful city gathers the three T's talent, technology, and tolerance. Yet what Emerson and Florida did not sufficiently take into consideration is that their model actually promotes a sort of natural selection of those who are creative and those who aren't. In other words, attracting young educated workers also means rejecting those who do not fit that mold. The gentrification of our cities is a planned and silently violent process that doesn't really have anything to do with a creative revival. In 2009, the Toronto Collective Creative Class Struggle exposed the reality behind the creative class. Let me read you their mission, uh, stated on their website. In 2007, the province of Ontario lured Richard Florida, the architect of the creative class, to Toronto. Millions of tax dollars are spent to pay his exorbitant salary to support his research institute at the University of Toronto and to sponsor his vision for our local economies. Creative class policies are designed to build money-making cities rather than secure livelihoods for real people. These policies celebrate a society based on inequality in which a select group of glorified professionals is supported by an invisible army of low-wage service workers. Is creativity innate? I mean, we as a society tend to see creatives as semi-god, and it's true that while most self-proclaimed creatives aren't particularly talented, I mean, they paid to be taught how to master their craft, and it's fine, by the way, I'm one of them. Some creators, inventors, really stand apart, set new trends that other creatives will then try to emulate. Those innately creative individuals can be found everywhere if we're willing to search for them. In factories, in student societies, on social media, creativity is everywhere, but only becomes relevant when all the people can make profit out of it. That's why I think we need to be cautious when we use the term creative. The creatives we see or think about are generally the ones who passed the natural selection, who made it to the city and are able to survive there. But what about the other ones, the artists, musicians, singers, who cannot survive in the city? Also, what makes a job creative? A few days ago, I asked my subscribers uh, on YouTube if they thought they were being creative at work or in their studies, and I found it interesting to see how many of you said either their job was meant to be creative but wasn't, or that their job wasn't usually considered to be creative but is in a way. Basically, how the perception of creativity can be vague or subjective. Most of the comments on that community post were from some of you guys showing me that pretty much any job can have a creative side to it, while some other comments said that institutions, the workplace, do not promote creativity but conformism. And I believe both are true. Creativity at work isn't limited to artists, nor is it limited to college-educated workers. Yet we in our society's tendency to romanticize creativity at work 
can be detrimental as it can prevent us from seeing that things aren't always as cute as they seem. Let me give you an example. Um, I think we all agree that graphic designing is a creative job, that's a cool job. And on the contrary, most of us would agree that factory work isn't very creative, that's not that cool. But what if the boss at your graphic design firm wants you and your colleagues to do a certain amount of projects every day following the guidelines of the client and time every project you do to then put that in an Excel document so that he can review your performances? Does it leave a lot of space for creativity? I'm not sure. But I know that that is what is expected from most office workers. Making creativity productive, ultimately killing creativity in the process. I don't know about you, but it's mind-blowing to me to see how creativity has turned into an economic asset in the last decades and how it's used by corporations, public institutions, social media to cover their capitalist nature. I recently went to a YouTube conference in the UK and a famous creator was invited as well to talk about their businesses, their experience on YouTube, how they sold limited merch over the years, um, using their audience and tasteful, risky projects. They emphasize that they work with young creatives, young artists, and even went as far as asking their audience if they knew of a friend or family member that was creative and could work for them. Basically, that whole process of reaching out to artists, young creatives, made the creator look cool. That's what you'd think from the outside. And most people at the conference seemed pretty interested and captivated by the creator's story. Until someone else, another famous creator, asked a question about something they've been thinking throughout the entire talk. She said something like, how do you make sure that all of this is sustainable and that the workers are treated fairly? In my head, I was like, go girl, immediately subscribe to your YouTube channel. And maybe it's just me, but it seems that the creator felt very uncomfortable because he didn't have any answers to provide. His merch sales were limited, which means no long-term contract with the factory, so no security for the workers. But that did not appear on social media. What appeared on social media is that they worked with young artists, a follower's friend or family member. That is good communication, isn't it? At a larger scale, cities all over Europe fight every year to win the cultural capital title. The city I was born in, Lille in France, got that title in 2004 and they've been promoting it since then. The city I live in today, Galway, won that title last year. And it follows Florida's creative class strategy, namely to create a creative friendly environment that attracts wealth. And as someone who's lived in Lille for many years and who's been chatting with people, locals from Galway, I realized that this has been very successful. Students, college educated workers, creatives have reconquered the cities and pushed families, the elderly, uh, working classes further away in the suburbs. In urban, so public, and businesses, so private policies, the terms creative and culture have become code words for economic growth. But now what about the creatives themselves? We tend to be extremely harsh on urban hippies. In France, you would call them bobo, uh, bourgeois bohemians. We like to blame them for their bad financial decisions or mock their lifestyle. I remember last year there was a big trend on YouTube where uh, young urban workers showed how much money they spend during a week. And let me tell you, the comment sections under those videos are very patronizing, very critical. It gets even worse on departmental videos where you realize that almost half the income of the person goes into rent. The YouTuber Graham Stephan made a success out of criticizing those videos actually, perpetuating the idea that millennials and now Gen Z really don't know how to spend their money. Also, that's something you hear a lot, is that they are responsible for the gentrification of big cities. But I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Actually, it is way more complicated than that. Our tendency to put the blame on individuals won't solve anything. You guessed it by now, the problem isn't the college-educated workers. In fact, after carefully following Florida guidelines, investing into renewal programs, revived cities expected a return on investment in the form of, yes, avocado toast bought at the cafe down the office, Starbucks coffee in the morning because you didn't have time to make your own, after work drinks at the local bar. That is how you make an economy work, by inciting people to buy, to consume. 
the pressure put on students, young urban workers, to have that lifestyle, to go out multiple times a week, to eat out with friends, to go shopping, to escape FOMO, is so strong. And yes, you could say that, and I'm pretty sure Graham Stephan would say that, you could simply just stay at home, make your own coffee, don't go out as much, but that is simply not what most people do. Since the dawn of time, young people have been more interested in socializing, in going to events, concerts, to grab a drink after work. It's just that now those things are happening in city centers where the cost for living and entertainment is very high. You see, financial experts recommend that you do not spend more than 30% of your income on rent. Yet the internet is full of people asking if it's normal that they spend 50% of their income on it. That's why I picked this passage from Sally Rooney's latest book as an introduction to this video, because I thought that it really captured the struggles faced by young workers in urban environments. When Aileen says that they are all working class in a way, what she means is that despite the fact that they have a lifestyle that looks very middle class, most of those young people are actually in a very precarious state. Sure, they are educated, they have college degrees, but that does not make them middle class. They do not own anything, most of them are in debt, they have to pay rent to a landlord and they work long hours for their boss. So should we really call them the creative class? Do you see now how we romanticize the very complex reality? You see, in fact, using the word class would imply that there is some sort of class struggle. Yet where would the creative class stand? Florida had a weird tendency to quote Marx in his book and even weirder tendency to misinterpret Marx. <laughs> And I think he completely missed the point of what class struggle really is. He said, Karl Marx had it more than partly right when he foresaw that workers would someday control the means of production. This is beginning to happen to a certain degree, although not as Marx thought it would, with the proletariat rising up and taking over factories. If workers control the means of production today, that is because it is inside their own heads. They are the means of production. Florida believed that the workers now own the means of production, because it's not tangible, it's ideas, it's in their heads. Yet it doesn't really change anything. Whether you work in a factory or an office, whether you produce goods or ideas, you'll have to stay there and do what you're told. You're gonna have to produce value for someone else and get a monthly compensation for that. If we want to talk about class struggle, then we have to recognize that Marx's working classes are in fact similar to Florida's creative class. And no, nothing has changed. Workers do not own the means of production. They have a certain set of skills that they have learned, like any factory or service worker, yet their skills are deemed more valuable. Actually, Marxist, real Marxist, sociology professor Eric Olin Wright coined a way more appropriate term to refer to the creative class. He called that the professional managerial class. Here we remove the creative label and go back to the essential, a socio-economic status. Yet once again, we're breaking people into smaller and smaller classes, thus breaking any sense of common class consciousness. As Wright said in his book, uh, How to be an anti-capitalist in the 21st century, things might have been a bit clearer uh, in the days of Marx. So you had uh, workers on the one hand, the owners, bosses on the other, and now things are a little bit different. You have the typical middle class family that owns a house, one car or two cars, some stocks, but will still work a nine to five job. But honestly, when you look at how wealth inequalities are increasing, how owning a place is almost getting impossible for even skilled, I don't really like this term, but skilled workers, well, you start to believe that all of this is a bit superfluous, that all those classes, all those, all those hierarchies aren't that important after all, meaning that the middle class dream is getting less and less accessible. So my idea and the point I wanted to make in this video isn't that young urban professionals have it as hard as service workers, working class workers. Of course they are not entirely similar, that would be unfair to say the contrary. My idea was to show you that if you remove all the filters and the vague concepts like the creative class, well all of a sudden things look very very simple. Some people are trying to survive and enjoy life as much as they can afford, and other people at the top are seeking economic growth at all costs, willing to push further and further away those who can't make it. It is as simple as that. Now, should we let that happen? 
That's it for today. I absolutely love doing the research for this one. So I really hope you like this video. Uh, if so, feel free to smash the like button, to share the video, to subscribe if it's not done already. I'd like to thank my friend Celia and her boyfriend Lee for uh, doing the voiceover at the beginning of the video. I would also like to thank my Patreons. A uh, special thank to Joshua, Jens and Carla. I've just launched a Discord chat room for my Patreons. So if you want to join, you'll find the link in the description box. Thank you again to The Guardian for sponsoring this video and yep, I'll see you next week. You know what, I'm actually going to put it here as like a reward for when I end the video.